After our previous consideration of the remarkable role of technology and its accelerating progress in the context of total war, uh, it's very appropriate for us to turn now to an examination of a new kind of war, uh, one quite literally that had to be pioneered and learned as it was going on, the war in the air. While the war in the air was not yet decisive in World War I, as it would assume tremendous importance in World War II, it certainly was a frightening portent of what future conflicts would hold, especially after this new weaponry had been pioneered and then perfected. This lecture surveys the rapid improvement in early airplanes. We'll examine the growth of the myth of the fighter ace as a legendary figure, but we'll also discuss ways in which the lived reality of fighter aces in fact uh, violated some of the the heroism that surrounded the, the legendary image. We'll examine how the fighter ace was treated as the knight of a new order of chivalry, redeeming a model of heroism high above the muddy trenches and contrast that with the lived reality. We will also follow the evolution of ideas about how air war could be deployed, including the beginnings of bomb, bombing from the air, which would later take such a toll of civilian life in World War II. We need first, obviously, to consider where the matter of flight stood before the war itself began. The potential utility and terror of airborne weapons had been well understood or anticipated prior to 1914, if not yet fully put into effect. After the first airplane flight of the Wright brothers in 1903 in Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, many writers of speculative fiction, today we would say science fiction, imagined a coming war in the future, transformed by fighting in the skies. Probably the most remarkable example of this was H.G. Wells' book, The War in the Air, from 1908. In addition, balloons had certainly been used for observation in earlier conflicts, and planes, too, had started to be used in colonial warfare against non-Western peoples. Now the question arose how the use of air war would, be, uh, would run in the First World War. Experts had debated what model of aircraft would be more promising, and this would be worked out in practice, as it turned out. The question was whether lighter-than-air aircraft, that's to say dirigibles or balloons, or heavier-than-air propelled aircraft, like airplanes, would be most useful. The major powers had established air branches before 1914, and France had gone furthest in this direction and had the most developed. On all sides in the First World War, there were about a thousand planes when the war broke out, and these numbers would increase exponentially in quick order. In spite of earlier speculation, uh, such as in science fiction works and popular fiction, about the usefulness of planes in combat, in fact, airplanes were mostly viewed by military men at the start of the war as being mostly useful for the ordinary tasks of reconnaissance essentially replacing the earlier role of cavalry in determining where the enemy was located and what movements were taking place. Aircraft also, it seemed, could play a useful role as artillery observers or range finders. Uh, and this certainly was part of the role that aircraft would play in the First World War. But by a very interesting pro uh, process of evolution, uh, a dynamic set in uh, which increasingly changed the nature of the role of at least some airplanes. If observation was important, it soon became important to eliminate the enemy's observers, and thus the way to air combat and individual dogfights, the stuff of legend of the fighter aces, was at last opened. And thus, in a process very similar to the one that we outlined in many cases when we earlier spoke of the total war of technology, the Air War II would see an incredible rate of advance and transformation. And technological advantage could shift from one side to the other with remarkable rapidity in the, in the course of several months. By the end of the war, certainly, a whole range of different planes was developed. These included fighters, they included new types of planes like seaplanes, as well as more long-distance bombers. New approaches to how air war was conducted were also tried out, long-range bombing, and the use of aircraft carriers was also pioneered. The air forces expanded enormously. British air forces in 1914 had fewer than 300 officers, 300 officers and about 1,800 men. 
By 1918, four years later, the British forces had over 27,000 officers and nearly 300,000 men working in different capacities of support as well as flying. Production of airplanes also of necessity exploded as the use of air war intensified. By the war's end, just for example, French industries were building as many planes every day as France had owned at the start of the war in 1914. By contrast, some countries less industrially developed, like Austria-Hungary and Russia, were not able to keep up in this competition and fell behind. New types of planes also proliferated as the result of experiment in new technologies. Many of these were biplanes, but experiments with single and triple wing planes also grew. Prominent models included the French Nupor and the Spa, the British Sopwith Pup and Sopwith Camel, and the German Fokker triplane. Uh, indeed, uh, as one drives on one's morning commute uh, in our own times, one might very well encounter artifacts of these days. And what I mean by that is uh, BMW cars. Uh, today's German car manufacturer, BMW, the Bavarian Motor Works, uh, during this period built plane engines during the war. And today, still, the logo of this company actually hints at those origins, uh, showing an abstract image of a white, prof white propeller and a blue sky. Photography, which was an adjunct of the observation capacity of airplanes, improved steadily as well, as did wireless technology towards the end of the war to allow planes to communicate their observations to the ground. Weaponry, likewise, also moved from the very primitive, that's to say, uh, opposed pilots shooting at one another with, with pistols or with shotguns to much more elaborate and lethal weaponry, including mounted machine guns. Now, very obviously, the question of how to deploy a machine gun on an airplane was a formidable engineering problem at these times. Uh, the danger was clear. Uh, a gunner who was too enthusiastic could end up shooting off his own propeller, and this obviously would result in disaster. Uh, at first, in an improvised fashion, metal plates were mounted on the propellers so as to deflect one's own bullets. Uh, but this was not a panacea. Uh, problems could emerge here as well. Um, if a machine gun was firing and hit one of these metal plates upon the propeller, well, the propeller was protected, but what if the, uh, what if the bullet ricocheted back towards the pilot or another member of a crew? Uh, at the same time, repeated hits, even of a metal-clad propeller, uh, could certainly produce metal fatigue and blow away the propeller at long last as well. This engineering challenge was finally solved by a Dutch engineer who was working for the Germans, by the name of Antony Fokker. He produced a gear, an interrupter gear, which synchronized the propeller with the firing of the guns, so that the bullets each time, barring disastrous malfunction, would be firing between the propeller's blades as the uh, uh, propeller uh, propelled the plane through the air, uh, not endangering the flyer uh, and the gunner. This invention, which uh, was remarkable for its time, uh, gave the Germans air superiority in the West, but it did so for less than a year. Soon, this innovation was imitated and replicated by the Allied side as well. And here we see an indication of a constant phenomenon that was at play throughout the conflict, superiority in the air, precisely due to such technological advances or tac uh, tactical advances, uh, shifted back and forth from the Allied side, that's to say the French and the British, to the, to the side of the Germans on the Western Front in the war itself. This showed the typical dynamic of technological races because each side's technological edge would very quickly be imitated, reproduced, or improved upon by the enemy. In 1918, the last year of the war, the uses of air power took a dramatic leap forward into the practice of attack and long-range bombing on the Western Front. And we'll speak more about bombing towards the end of today's lecture. I want to proceed now to talk about some of the, the aura of heroism and of hero worship that surrounded very quickly the figure of the fighter ace. And indeed, the term itself was a word that was developed during the war to, to indicate a, a fighter pilot who had many kills to his credit. The myth of the fighter ace ran as follows. 
far above the muddy trenches, above the stalemate and the deadlock where the poor devils, the infantry down below were slogging it out. High up in the skies, these airmen were seen as daredevils. They were knights of the air. They had managed to overcome the horrors of the trenches to recover a chivalric, a nobler and cleaner form of warfare in the clouds and in the skies. And this form of heroic warfare would allow an emphasis on the role of the individual. The individual's heroism mattered for something. Individual skill and chivalry could make a difference. And we see in remarkable ways, paralleling our earlier discussion of stormtroopers and their alleged recovery of a personally heroic form of warfare, even in the trenches, that this phenomenon was in some ways quite related. In a paradox that we already have encountered in our discussion of the use of technology in total war, we see here as well that modern technology could be combined with or fused with a seeming revival of older traditions. So too in this case, over and over again, the fighter aces were celebrated as being knights of the air, looking back to the earlier age of chivalry. And the images that were associated with this proliferated as well. To give but one example, German planes were painted with iron crosses, making them redolent of earlier medieval times. A powerful myth of the admired fighter ace was also used in propaganda as an example of what one's own side could achieve with sufficient will, sufficient heroism, and daring. The fighter ace was even said to be a new physical type. It's a very interesting set of of mythologized images that soon accrued to the figure of the fighter ace. In some ways resembling that, uh, uh, the figure of a motor car race driver, fighter aces were said to all be thin, quick, extremely alert, possessed of a certain controlled nervousness, as well as total awareness of their surroundings. Uh, whether or not they actually had noble birth, they all supposedly shared a certain common aristocratic bearing and knightliness. And they were all said, this was obviously an idealized image, to value fair play and gamesmanship in combat. It was said that fighter aces were in fact so noble that they respected even their enemies and stories circulated, and certainly there were some cases to back this up, of dramatic and noble gestures like fighter aces throwing wreaths down upon the, uh, the graves of fallen foes, uh, their own enemies whom they had shot down in order to show gestures of respect in spite of the fact that these men were enemies. Fighter ace heroes included many, but the prominent among them were British aces Edward Mannock and Alfred Ball, and especially the German Red Baron, as he was called, Manfred von Richthofen, in his famous red fighter plane, all of these men, as it turns out, were killed in the war. I want to speak a little in detail about Richthofen personally. Um, Richthofen scored the highest number of victories in the war, that's to say 80 kills, as they were called, and he was decorated with Germany's highest medal, the Paul le Merite. It's a little bit of a paradox that Germany's highest decoration uh, bore a title that uh, um, was in the language of the hereditary enemy, the French. It was more uh, popularly known as the Blue Max Medal. Um, and what truly is striking is the way in which the exploits of this so-called Red Baron were used for propaganda on both sides, in fact, in a public relations campaign. His enemies, the Allies, would uh, uh, depict him in the propaganda as cruel and vicious in his approaches. There was an element of truth to that as well. But at the same time, the Germans played him up as an example of modern heroism. Uh, he himself had been born in Germany's eastern provinces, where his aristocratic family hailed from, uh, from Breslau, in fact, uh, today in Poland. Uh, Richthofen was, as the, the very name von Richthofen suggests, uh, of noble birth. He hailed from an old Prussian family that had become famous in serving Frederick the Great in his wars of the 18th century, and as was accepted practice in these old aristocratic families, uh, Richthofen had first signed up for the cavalry, uh, the, the, the very respected and traditional branch of the prestigious armed forces. Uh, soon, however, as it became clear that the cavalry was not going to come in for its expected share of glory, 
on, uh, in the course of the First World War, Richthofen instead uh, entered the air service in search of adventure and of fame. And he indeed would serve as a pilot over that titanic battle of Verdun, the, the blood mill of Verdun uh, below him, as it turns out, that we had discussed in an earlier lecture. What's fascinating to observe is how Richthofen himself, in addition to the German propaganda authorities, developed a legend around the figure of the Red Baron. Uh, he was named the Red Baron because of his famous red plane that he had actually painted in these colors to set himself apart and to quite distinctively uh, and in a taunting way uh, provoke his enemies uh, by his very conspicuousness. Uh, he developed a, another habit that became famous of, uh, of commissioning a little silver cup to be made with the, uh, the date and the name of his kill. Uh, and uh, as these kills mounted, so too did the number of his silver cups. Soon, Richthofen was competing against himself in trying to increase the number of his scores, of his kills, which by the end of the war, um, close to the end of the war as he's killed, uh, had numbered 80. At the same time, and this is what I meant earlier by um, the reality of the air war not always matching these heroic myths, uh, Richthofen, as he tried to uh, uh, increase his numbers of kills, uh, didn't always sally forth looking for the strongest of opponents. He was not averse to chasing down slower planes or inexperienced enemy pilots in order to increase his own personal record. And contemporaries who knew him and admired him in many ways nonetheless were realistic about his character. They noted that he enjoyed this. He saw it not only as a necessary evil, but as something in the nature of a game. And even Richthofen's own brother, who was also a fighter ace, at one point called him a butcher. Uh, Richthofen preferred to think of it as gamesmanship, sportsmanship, something like hunting. His enjoyment uh, reminds us of similar phenomena among the stormtroopers, those men who enjoyed war too much. Richthofen, at 25, was made leader of a fighter wing. Such were his skills. And this fighter wing came to be called the Flying Circus because, just like stormtroopers would be, uh, it was shuttled around as necessary to the most crucial parts of the front. He emphasized among his uh, subordinates discipline. He conducted debriefings after every mission to re-examine what had gone right and what had gone wrong. And his powers of instruction were such that many of Germany's other fighter aces for the rest of the war had in fact been his pupils. But as the war dragged on, Richthofen changed psychologically. A, a wound might have contributed to this in part. As the war dragged on, he seems to have been thrown into a cycle of despair, one in which he faced the impossible task of heightening his own legend. Uh, he, he started to pursue that to him, magical number of 100 kills uh, as a aim that he sought to achieve, and yet it seemed clear to him that at some point uh, this sort of existence would have its end. Uh, his own teacher, for instance, had died in a, uh, in a collision, a mid-air collision with one of his own pilots, uh, so even very skilled pilots could be brought down by accident. And it didn't become clear to uh, Richthofen uh, until the very end that the price that he'd have to pay would be his own life. Indeed, on April, in April of 1918, uh, his own death took place. And the circumstances of that death are, in fact, to this very day, shrouded in mystery and debate. Uh, it's unclear whether it was a Canadian pilot uh, who was caught in a larger uh, melee in the skies uh, who brought Richthofen's plane down, um, um, shooting him and killing him in the process, or whether, on the contrary, it was Australian troops stationed below who were firing uh, on the airplanes uh, who ultimately were the ones who had brought this about. And nonetheless, it's clear that his plane went down. We will never know, apparently, precisely how. And in a gesture that did accord with these mythologized versions of what it meant to be a fighter ace, uh, a full military funeral was organized for him with full military honors, by Australian pilots uh, on enemy territory. When Richthofen finally had gone down, pursuing his own legendary status in, in what ultimately turned out to be a race to death, he was only 26 years old.
After Richthofen was killed in April of 1918, the last leader of his squad was a man who would play an important historical role later in the 20th century. Uh, at this point, he was still a trim, not as he later was in life, expansive fighter ace, Hermann Goering, who later became commander of the Nazi Air Force in World War II and would be instrumental in the changes that took place in a devastating war in the air. In reality, great dangers, as is obvious, accompanied the role of airmen, who were often imperiled by their own technology and its drawbacks or its flaws, as well as the, uh, the enemy and enemy fire. Many accidents took place in training. Training itself was often only several months long. And in a very real sense, fighting in the air was so new that its tactics had to be invented and improvised. And many of them, indeed, remarkably, still form the basis for air war today. British pilots experienced horrendous uh, rates of casualty, about 50% in the course of the entire war. Um, it also has to be mentioned that, um, it might simply be stating the obvious, but that not all pilots went on to be fighter aces. It's estimated by one study that only about 5% of fighters acquired this status. Many more were shot down by fighter aces before they had a chance to gain the necessary experience. And in spite of the myth of lone heroism of the duels and the skies that surrounded the fighter aces. In fact, massed formations and mass battles uh, were in fact increasingly important. Uh, and Richthofen's organization of a, of a flying wing, the flying circus itself made that clear. I want to turn now to examine a very important key case of continuity between this total war, the First World War, and how Aspects of its destruction were later perfected in the Second World War uh, and indeed are still with us today. And I mean by that in particular, the beginnings of bombing, the beginnings of bombing. Beyond the role of observation or fighting in the skies, the role of aircraft in bombing was also pioneered in the First World War. It wasn't brought to the later perfection, I, I use the phrase ironically, uh, but certainly was pioneered in this sense. Um, at the start of the war, planes could throw grenades or small bombs, but by a certain inevitability, uh, eventually, planes were ever more outfitted with this equipment, and soon bombs weighing thousands of pounds could be dropped from planes. The aim in this bombing was not only to damage the enemy's war effort behind the lines, uh, but also, most certainly, to create panic and demoralization. And what this implied as well was an increasingly indiscriminate targeting of civilians as well. The bombing, in spite of its tremendous inaccuracy at the start of the war, uh, increasingly underlined the totality of war, as civilians would become the targets and victims of this war. There were sporadic first uses of bombing, uh, including a, a plane that flew uh, over Paris and dropped bombs there in 1914, and Belgian towns as well. Uh, but a horrifying um, profile that loomed up in the skies of air war was that of the Zeppelin. That is to say, a uh, airborne dirigible of enormous size and shadowed contours that the Germans used in order to start bombing Great Britain in January of 1915. These Zeppelins, as they were called, were hydrogen-borne dirigibles named after Count Ferdinand von Zeppelin, a pioneer in uh, this aircraft, who had built the first one in 1900. Eleven of them were ready for use as the war began, uh, but they proved very vul vulnerable to enemy fire from the ground. Even though they were capable of achieving significant altitudes, they weren't always safe. Um, and also strong winds or bad weather uh, was another thing that could really disrupt their plans. I mean, there were cases of of Zeppelin simply being blown away uh, in the North Sea as a result of strong winds. During the war, 123 Zeppelins were used by the Germans, and almost 80 of them were shot down or collapsed on their own due to technical problems. The Zeppelins, however, certainly created terror. They mounted more than 50 raids on Britain in the First World War. And their major raids ended in 1916, not out of humanitarian concern, but because a new weapon had been developed in order to fulfill the same task, it was hoped more efficiently. They were replaced by long-range bombing planes, like the twin-engine Gotha bomber. Alarm and panic in Britain increased, in part for a simple reason. 
Great Britain felt that uh, it had been immune from modern war on its own land. The concept of splendid isolation had been a key concept and now very clearly had broken down. The anxiety that would follow would be most significant, and this too was yet another example of the uh, <coughs> shock of the new that had to be dealt with. A concerted bombing campaign now began. The German campaign uh, with long-range bombers, the Gotha bombers, in 1917 to 1918 specifically targeted London. While the losses, especially when measured against the horrific record of the Second World War by this bombing campaign of about 1,400 people killed by bombing in Britain were not in any proportion to the, the later devastation of World War II, but nonetheless, the event itself left a tremendous impact. Uh, in London, anxieties grew on the part of workers about whether, uh, whether their factories would be bombed. Uh, uh, morale certainly had taken a blow. And at night, thousands would sleep in the subway stations uh, in what they hoped would be underground security. Uh, this is another case of scenes that are very familiar to us from the Second World War, uh, actually having at least a preview, in a sense, during World War I. The impression that was created was very strong on all sides. And after the First World War, one would sometimes hear among military thinkers and military planners uh, repeated almost as if it were a, a dictum or a law of war that, quote, the bomber always gets through. The bomber always gets through. Uh, this clearly wasn't entirely true because in tandem with the development of long-range bombers, uh, there most certainly already was the development of anti-aircraft positions, uh, searchlights probing the skies uh, um, in tandem with these anti-aircraft installations. Uh, but even more crucially, in sort of a dialectical process that we've already seen uh, in more detail when we discuss the, uh, the growth of gas warfare and the evolution of gas warfare with both sides surpassing one another in technological advance, so to here one could see a exchange of this sort of warfare as the British responded in kind. The British prepared to respond en masse against German targets in part in retaliation against this targeting of London and other British targets, but also simply because one couldn't allow the enemy to have a monopoly on this form of war, it was felt. And thus, British forces at first targeted uh, Zeppelin bases in Cologne, in the Rhineland, uh, and in Dusseldorf. Uh, they also sought to target in what they hoped would be the most efficient and cost-effective way certain other industrial targets, in particular the factories producing poison gas in Germany. Uh, but the uh, inexactness of bombing technology in the First World, uh, First World War was still considerable and the results were still disappointing. But the very severity and seriousness of the situation was such that reorganization was felt to be necessary in Great Britain. And thus a, a historic event took place uh, nearing the end of the war as on April 1st, 1918, uh, the first independent air force, that's to say not just an adjunct to other fighting forces, but the first independent military uh, organization devoted to the air war, the British Royal Air Force, was established. The British now moved on to larger plans that would finally only come into fruition in the Second World War, plans for long-distance bombing of Berlin. As it turns out, the distances uh, were too great and the technology at the disposal of the British forces was still too limited in order to really bring this plan into full effect. But even these hints of what lay in the future, what had been thought of, were suggestive. The terrible legacy of this air war still lay ahead in the mass bomber raids of World War II. But the fact that mass bombing paradoxically, had not yet been tried out fully in World War I, ironically made the idea even more appealing to many military planners, precisely because its full potential had not yet fully been explored. In the course of today's lecture, we've examined uh, a form of warfare that had to be pioneered and had to be learned as one went along. We want to examine in our next lecture a form of war that had been fully expected and in fact people thought would be decisive, the war at sea.
We'll recall that uh, the naval arms race had done a lot to uh, increase tensions and ultimately create the poisonous international atmosphere in which the First World War would break out. But surprises were at store in the war at sea as well, which we'll examine in our next lecture.